Bishop Davis has been traveling to Ghana, West Africa for the past 20 years. For the last 15, he's facilitated trips, and the last six years, I've been on board helping with those coordinations. Dama T. Pongo, who is a young up-and-coming radio personality in the Chicagoland area, is now beginning to take people over to Ghana, West Africa as well. I'm so excited that these two men have come together and now we are working together so that we'll be able to bring and experience the Sankofa tour of Ghana, West Africa to you. Why don't you listen in to some of the conversation that they'll have explaining what the Sankofa trip means to them. What was it like uh, coming to Ghana your first time? Now, you, you've done this trip yeah. several times. I mean, Man. how many years have you been doing this? So, we're going into year number 15, and, uh, and the number of trips are too numerous to count at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, but my first time going to West Africa was a desire of mine all my life, since I was a child, to go to Ghana specifically. Uh, but I ended up taking a trip uh, in 2002 to uh, Senegal and then to uh, Gambia and then to Ghana. Yeah, I think you know this too. My, my folks are from Ghana. Both my mm -hmm. parents born and raised in Ghana. That's where Domiti Pongo comes mm -hmm. from, my name. Mm -hmm. And I remember going when I was six years old. I, I remember having fun with my cousins, remembering that it wasn't so different than it was in the States. Well, what was it about Ghana specifically that made you want to? Yeah, so that was a childhood dream. I remember yeah. um, when Facebook first came out, um, you know, I had friended someone and they said, is this the same Lance Davis who used to talk about going to Ghana when we were in sixth grade? And it was true. Uh, I mean, that's all I used to talk about was going to Ghana. And I really don't know why that hit me so hard as a child. There was something about Ghana that really resonated within me yes. early on as a, as a, as a child. And I, I just waited for that moment to be able to go. You know what really opened my eyes when I went to the slave castles in Ghana? Mm -hmm. I call them dungeons. Mm -hmm. They're called slave castles yes. historically, but dungeons is more appropriate. Mm -hmm. What you feel, you can literally feel the spirit mm -hmm. of our ancestors when you're in that room. Yes, I don't know yes. what's the same for you. Absolutely the same. And I, and I believe that your spirit knows where you're from. Yes. You know, you don't yes. necessarily need a yes. DNA test yes, to tell you true. because your spirit is telling you yeah. Ghana is the place for you to go. Do yes. you see any change in the people that traveled with you? Then to now, when you came back, did something change? What was it? What did you notice? Of the what people was... have changed. Number one, the first thing that I realized is that people who go to Ghana and get a chance to really experience the slave castles, and we got to think about that. Um, there's this thing called spiritual wickedness in high places, right? Folks, when they walk into the slave dungeons, mm -hmm. they get a chance to experience their feet not only being on the motherland, but being in a place where only the strong could survive. So the majority of the Africans who were taken into slavery came by way of Ghana, which is called the gateway to Africa. It's all the, so the gateway to the new world. So the majority of those ships that were coming to West African shores were lined up right there from Senegal all the way to Ghana, but the majority of them, over 66% of them, were right there in Ghana. I think that that's the place where we need to return. If we're going to Sankofa, it means returning to your roots. I believe that the entryway for uh, those who are looking for their origination, for their roots, to be able to go into Ghana, because that is the gateway back into the land from which from once they've come. I believe that as we go into Ghana as uh, sojourners, we are able to then find out why it is that our humanity was worth more than all the gold of the Gold Coast at that time. It's that returning back to Ghana, it's that returning back to our roots that gives us a sense of not only self-worth, but also heritage worth. For the longest, it seems like our heritage was something that we really don't care much about. 
even when you look at today's society uh, in America, that we don't really appreciate our heritage and our history. And so this Sankofa trip is designed to make it so that we recognize that heritage does matter, that where you came from does matter. And many people avoid places because those places are shameful. They remind them of a, a sordid past. But then the return back to Ghana shows individuals that you've got nothing to be ashamed of. As a matter of fact, your history and where you came from is something to be very proud of. So that's what we're proud of, and that is giving people that opportunity to discover that side of themselves that was searching for themselves and to also let them know about about the value and the jewel of a nation that Ghana is. And, and I'll stop you right there, mm -hmm. don't lose your train of mm -hmm. thought, but where our feet literally were, where our feet was, we were standing on hundreds and hundreds of years of, in one of the rooms of, of, of feces, yes. of blood, of human yes. remains. Yes. They purposely didn't excavate one of the rooms mm -hmm. so that you could see that when they cleared the, the soil, it was literally about yeah. what? would you say a foot yeah just of, the of grind of all and you're literally matter. standing yeah, yeah, on it yeah yeah but go ahead and it yeah. feels like solid and it ground. feels like it feels solid like, ground yeah because like it's cement. that matted down absolutely yeah, yeah, so. um and and i think that what happens is people uh have this um mindset they have preconceived notions you know am i gonna like it am i gonna see animals are the people gonna you know not like me because i'm a black american and right. all this other kind of stuff I think within the first couple of days, that's gone. Yeah, that's yeah. erased. You see, uh, you know, black folks working on buildings. They are engaged in the architectural trades. They are doing business with themselves. They, and while there might be poverty, it does not equate to violence. Right. That is the biggest piece that I brought back with me. Mm -hmm. When I talked to my travelers, mm -hmm. I sat down and I asked them, what, what is something that you saw that, that was remarkable to you? Number one, that poverty didn't equal sadness mm -hmm. because they said the people had nothing, but they found a way to be happy yeah. and healthy. 90 year old women walking around with skin mm -hmm. just of gold, yes. just melanated, just beautiful. And then they said too, why, why is it no, why do, why am I walking around amongst all of this poverty, but I don't feel I don't feel like I'm in danger. That's I don't right. feel like I'm going to be robbed. That's okay. right. So what is it unique about the American experience, mm -hmm. specifically the black American experience, mm -hmm. uh, because of what happened in slavery that has mm -hmm. created poverty equaling violence, right? Yeah. When we look at the violent construct that is around urban cities around the United States, more specifically even Chicago, we know that something needs to change. We know that something needs to happen that's going to improve the lives of our young people. And right now, no one has any answers. We're looking at children who are going to schools that can't teach them. And they're not learning in these environments. Along with the environment, the social environment that they're involved in, that of not snitching and other uh, deadly, um, you know, consequential activities that are, that are taking place within and among our children, it requires a redress, it requires a corrective measure. And what is that corrective measure? We believe that that corrective measure is through a Sankofa that we ourselves have seen young people who have gone on a Sankofa, who have gone to Ghana, West Africa, while they may not have been the best students, when they returned, they were great citizens because they had a renewed appreciation for life, a renewed outlook on who they are and their historicity. So I think it's vitally important for us to send our children, both those who are in challenged situations and those who are in affluent situations, to have a better outlook on life and have a better outlook on their own future by going to Ghana, West Africa. When I look at folks who come back from Ghana, I find that they don't complain as much. Right, right. That they have a, new, a renewed appreciation for brothers and sisters all over the world. Yes. Uh, and then finally, that they can't wait to get back again. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and there's, there's this, this appreciation for the diaspora, this common thread. Mm -hmm. But it's something, it's something unique. You will see someone in Ghana and they look like somebody you might know from Chicago. Yes, like this. yes, yes. They look like Kiki. You know? <laughs> That's right. And so you see that commonality, but then also there's something specific about folks from Chicago because I bumped into you guys yep. halfway across the world 
I had no idea mm. that, uh, that that you guys were Chicagoans. Can we talk a bit about how we met? So what, yeah. what, you guys were at Coconut Grove. So I'm we in were, Elmina yep. in, in Coconut Grove. So you guys had toured. I wasn't there. I actually came a little bit later because I was tending to some matters, right? Yes. So we, you all had already met uh, in Elmina, and then we were staying in Coconut Grove, and so were you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that was when I found out you were on the trip, and not only were you on the trip, but you were in the same hotel with us. So I said, Don't T Pongo, Pongo is here with his people. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> then so we saw so the next morning we get ready for breakfast and then the next thing you know I see you out there and you're having breakfast with, with folks. Folks who I thought were Ghanaians because they were sitting there eating right. and you know and it's a it's a very popular spot, Coconut Grove, for, yeah. for Ghanaians to go. Uh, and yet they were African Americans. And that tells you just how much at home we can be. Yes. We can float freely through our society and no one knows that we're American until we open our mouths. Uh, but the one thing that I really, for me personally, what I take from Ghana um, and, and I try, I, I really find a tremendous amount of joy in drilling boreholes. Uh, being able to provide water uh, for folks in Ghana blesses me in that I have a stake in where I came from, yes. number one. Yes. Number two, we're providing, where there's water, there's life. So we're providing life to communities um, that normally would have to have a, a constancy of sickness because of the types of water that they drink. Mm -hmm. um, but when we come out of that experience with uh, drilling for water, I always find that I am so appreciative to be alive. I'm appreciative to be of being black, mm -hmm. and I'm appreciative of that kind of historicity that evidences me as a black man as being a builder, a creator, a person of peace. You know, I mean, yeah. think about it. In Ghana, it's the pe most peaceful place on earth, That's as far as I'm concerned. Yes, it is. Um, it is. And so I am, I am always amazed that when our folks go and they come back. And they say, I can't believe how we've been lied to. And I hope you bring 50,000 more people with you in the years to come. And you too. And we'll have our, our joint groups have this turn out the whole oh, place of all of West Africa. I'm talking about specifically when we get to where we had um, embarked, if you will, mm -hmm. on those ships as human chattel yeah. going through the door of no return. Then we get a chance as the descendants, mm. right, mm. to return and go back through the door of what's called the door of return. return. That is true Sankofa, being able to walk through that door of, of return and know that I know exactly where I come from. Many sociologi uh, sociological folks, uh, anthropological folks will say that a people are defined by land and history, right? Those are two, two areas, land and history. Our problem is, is that our history starts with slavery and, and that slavery starts in a land, right? And so that is our whole, um, that's how we wrap our mind around our existence when in fact slavery or transatlantic slave trade was a small segment of the history of black people in the world, just it. a microcosm, and we need to be able to go all the way back. So when we talk about Sankofa, I'm talking about Sankofa, Sankofa, uh, going back to when we were not dependent upon anyone, but we were dependent upon as uh, as a people for uh, our bauxite, uh, you know, uh, mining technologies because of our our gold technology. And it is, I find this to be quite interesting as well, mm. and that is that when we were in those slave castles, right, the slave dungeons. And we're down there where they would keep a hundred women in this small room about the size of this room. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of the men over here and the children were interspersed or whatever. I find it very interesting that the whole land of Ghana was called the Gold Coast by the Portuguese, mm -hmm. by those captors. And the fact that we were so valuable that they would then, as opposed to hiding and keeping all of their gold and all of those rooms and all of their spices and all their valuable trade goods, that they would empty all of that out and now have human beings traded because our value was more valuable than all of the gold in the land. 
I find that to be the most, um, that's hard for me to accept, especially today, because we still are producing gold for everybody. We consume, mm -hmm. we consume and we purchase in a way that is blind purchasing. Yes. So no matter who you are, no matter what you think about us, as long as you're not us, we'll spend our money with you. And you know what I love about the trip too, and reconnecting with African culture, you start to see the, the threads of commonality between black American culture and, and Africa, right? So here the history starts with slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, there the history somewhat ends with colonization. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so, that, yeah. so, so even as you see that Africa, the reason why it's that dark continent, the reason mm -hmm. why we see it's being ravaged the way it is, the reason why they're able to have uh, people from outside countries, be it China, be mm -hmm. it America, mm -hmm. drilling offshores in countries and not even getting the people the value of what they've already taken from the land. Uh, it, it comes from that history of colonization, which is a springboard right off of slavery, mm -hmm. which once you make that trip, you make that connection, and you mm -hmm. find out that the diaspora, no matter where you are, isn't that different. That's right. It's what makes it so important for young people to experience this trip is the fact that I'm really passionate about this piece, that young people know that the world is open to them that there are opportunities, that there's a world outside of Chicago. We have young people in the city of Chicago who haven't been outside their blocks, young people who haven't been outside of Country Club Hills, etc. And once the world opens up to you, what happens? You understand what opportunities are out there for you. You understand what, what, what majors you can go into, what opportunities there are. I mean, it really changes the way you view the world and the way you view opportunities. I can't tell you how many uh, students and young people I've mentored who told me I have an idea, I can't bring this to fruition. And I say, why? And they, they start to tell me, well, because no one's ever done it before. And I'm like, so? Has no one ever done it before? Have you never seen it before? Right? So we need to open up the world of, of possibilities. And something as simple as traveling, not only traveling, but traveling to your homeland, it, 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 it opens up the world of possibilities in a way that only you can experience if you've been there. As far as donors supporting, I think what, what donors need to understand is that when we talk about how to deal with violence in the city of Chicago, I think in many ways we over complicate the problem in, in a way, our approaches to it. We think about, you know, after school programs, we think about these different things, but we don't really get to the root of the problem. What's really happening? Well, in Africa, poverty doesn't equal violence. In Chicago, it does. What, what about taking these, these kids, uprooting them, and putting them in other places and seeing if they could see how the world operates in a different setting of what that would do, what that bring back with them? And that becomes a part of their impact exponentially when they come back and talk to their peers. They come back with a sense of self. They come back with an, with an ability to inspire others. They come back with perspective. They come back as teachers, as their own little historians, right? And um, for a donor to have an opportunity to be a part of that is, is a blessing that you, can't even, that you can't even begin to describe. You know, those of us who are blessed uh, to give and have an opportunity to, well, what are we giving to? It's not just throwing money out of a situation and hoping it goes away. It's not just, it has to be more than voting. It has to be more than all of that. All of that is the base level of what it is that we need to do. But if you have an opportunity to be in this room and, and to really affect the lives of young people for decades and generations to come, this is the place to do it and this is the way that we should do it. We, you can even look at other cultures. Uh, I, I think a lot of why we see immigrants flourish in America, whether it be Korean immigrants, Chinese immigrants, Mexican immigrants, uh, there's something rooted to back home, or even the Mecca that Muslims go to, or, uh, or the Jewish, they're able to go, the, the, the connectivity to Jerusalem. Um, every people who I see as, as strongly rooted uh, in their culture uh, has a sense of self, identity, and strength. And it will be beautiful if you are able to foster that in the next generation to come. I love, uh, what I love about the Adinkra Simba Sankofa representing going back home, I always think about what's the next step, right? So you go back home, but eventually you gotta leave the house. So when you leave back out, the bird has to fly. When it flies out, what does it bring you with him? What is it taking with him? And what does it bring you with him uh, when, it, when it's going? So I, when I think about Sankofa, what it means to me is not only connecting with your roots and connecting with home, but it means what are you bringing back home? And then when you leave home and go out again, what are you bringing back out into the world? And what, what we're missing is young people who have purpose. Uh, and, and I think Sankofa really speaks to purpose uh, truth and being fruitful in your comings and goings and that's something I wish more young people had an opportunity to do and I think that this trip uh, gives them that opportunity. Let me ask you this though about the young people that we had with us. We had a group of about oh, yeah. uh, five or six high schoolers who were with us. So what did you think when you saw them in Ghana? 
I was just happy to see somebody that was almost close to my age. I brought, <laughs> yeah. I brought my seniors with yeah, me. You know right, what I mean? That's right, that's right. I brought my, you know, the seniors got money yes. to spend. So yes, they yes. came with us, which is why we need to find sponsors to get more young people out correct, of there. Correct. And I was so happy because when I was in high school, every name under the sun that people could use to tease me, mm -hmm. what is my name, what is my complexion, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. I never, I got past the point of internalizing it mm -hmm. and feeling sorry for those who were teasing me because yeah. I, I said, I'm you. Mm -hmm. And the reason you don't understand that is because because of external factors and that will hunt you later on in life yes. if you hold on to that mindset true that was nipped in the bud early with your trip mm. so when I talk to those kids and I say you know what what uh you we was changing names they didn't have a trouble with my name because they've been messing with names yeah, all, that, all day that's right that's right <laughs> you know right. that yes. th th there was a there was yes. a respect there was a decorum there's mm. a a reverence for elders mm -hmm. that that lives in African culture mm -hmm. that didn't translate to American culture mm. and it was just a beautiful thing to see because you know being African I have this dual culture because I grew up in America America, yeah. um, it, it felt like watching myself experience something I wish I could have had mm. when I was when I was in their position. It's yeah. a powerful, powerful thing. They'll be talking about that for, for decades to come. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I mean, can you imagine being an African American child and being able to say, or an African American mother, father, being yeah. able to say, I've been to West Africa, I've been to the motherland. Um, that it's not like you want to use it to uh, to you know to trust to someone. someone. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. right. But you want to be able to say that and be able to say that I know who we really are. And it informs who you are. It informs. It, it gives does. you. You you see. You didn't. You don't realize how how rare it is to see yourself in a positive light until mm -hmm. you go to Africa and you see billboards yeah. right, of yeah. melanated people. Yes. Until you see until you see sculptures yes. with you. I, yes. that, that, I bought this there's actually this sculpture. This one right here on the desk. Uh -huh. Yeah. I yeah. bought the same one for my sister because mm. it looks just like it. Really? So when I so when I bring a little girl to Africa mm -hmm, with me mm -hmm. and I say, This is you, you're, yeah, you're so yeah. beautiful, they sculpted yes. you. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, out of that, out of Ebony. Ebony. For out crying. Ebony. Come on, yes. there's, there's something powerful about that yeah. and, and we can't we can't overstate the importance of that. Yeah. And that's why we're saying yeah. you gotta go you to gotta Ghana. Go. You gotta and go. you gotta be able to discover your roots, you gotta be able to mm -hmm. discover who you really are and um, and I think that uh, young people who get a chance to go early on, because I've seen young people who are now adults who mm -hmm. have gone, they have a better appreciation of the things that they have, they have a better appreciation of where they came from ultimately, and I think that they're going to, as we, we see that we're in a more of a global economy, yeah. um, that they'll find then no hesitancy in doing business or, you know, or advanced learning over in Ghana. And that's uh, so I, I'm curious to know how you did it, because when I took my, my folks to Ghana, mm -hmm. we, we showed them a DVD, we answered all of their questions, let them know what, you know, what they need to bring with them, what they can expect, what not to expect, mm -hmm. you know, thinking mm -hmm. about all the stereotypes you think about when you think about Africa. Mm -hmm. Did you prep your travelers the same way? The only thing we would prep our travelers with is the things that you need to bring. Um, and certainly gestures and things that you should not say uh, right. to offend other people. Uh, but for the most part, we like a, a blind trip. We like you going ah, okay. in totally uh, unprepared as relates to what you're going to see. Why is that? And the most important part about that is you get a chance to take your own preconceived notions overseas with you. Mm -hmm. Which means that when you experientially see that this place is nothing like what you have been told or what you have set up as your own mental construct, then when we get to the debriefing mark, the midway mark, right, which is where you all would have been once you go through the castles, you've seen the marketplace, you've seen a lot of the countryside, now at that midway point, you get a chance to hold guilt because of your own ignorance, which means that you're more likely to do something with that ignorance than if I just prepped you all the way at the beginning. Because you might return back the way you came, and that's the last thing we want. A Sankofa is to return to your roots, and that little bird, that Sankofa bird, mm -hmm. um, that symbolizes Sankofa, has a piece of fruit in its mouth. Right? Some say it's a fig, some say it's an egg, but whatever that fruit is, that means in returning to my history, there's something valuable that I'm flying forward with. 
And, and one thing that, that I see um, is that when you had your seniors, mm -hmm. right, they were engaged in a lot of things, and they were they were older, and yes, so they were. they were engaged in a lot. Like 50, so, 60 plus. Yes. Yeah, well, so, but not even 60, 70 plus, yeah. So when I saw them, you scared me when you got to 50. Yeah, yeah, I had to, I had to, I had to end it's it. It's like, <laughs> I'm going to tell you, you got to leave my office. But, <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know what I, what I saw was that I didn't expect for that crowd to come alive at all. Right, and, right, and, right. But when you all were at uh, Coconut Grove and they had the African dancers come on, all of a sudden their whole countenance changed. Oh, they come were on. dancing. I know some Ben Gay going on that night, you know, but, <laughs> but they were dancing and they were, they were having a wonderful, wonderful time. And it's one of those things where that's probably the last thing they thought that they would end up doing if they went to Africa. And there was such a blessing in being a part of an experience that someone has literally been waiting 70 years for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and to have that happen with me, right? Yeah. And, and to see them experience something, experience a joy that they hadn't ever felt in their lives, because these people are well-traveled, have been to other places, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but there's something unique about them being with their people mm. in a different space. Yes. And the conversations you have overseas are totally different. Mm. I don't know what it is yes. about going overseas, the depth of conversation you have. I mean, yes. we feel like we've known each other for years yes, yes, just yes. because we've experienced the same thing. Absolutely. So when we talked at the table and we had, there was no age, there was no, yeah. our, every, there was no socioeconomic thing going on. There was yes. just the sand, the beach, the water, mm. the fufu and soup. That's, that's it. And, <laughs> and, and, and our story. And our that's stories. Right. That's you know? right. And that's what Sankofa, Sankofa is all about. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. I think so too. I do believe that the Sankofa is the blending of stories of historicity and the stories of present and being able to merge those and have those converge and then allowing for the recipient mm. to be able to return back here with a much more mature and a much uh, better informed outlook on the world as you said yes. you know um, I think that that's important and, and people say the first question they ask is how much does it cost mm -hmm. when in fact Every 100% of the people who we've taken uh, over the years have never ever come back and said, I think I paid too much. Wow, yeah. That's very No true. one ever has ever done that. That's very true. Yep. They never That's ever true. say, well, I think that this trip should have been cheaper. So all it proves to us is that we're not charging enough. So instead of how much does it cost, it should be how much is this worth? That's right. Because it is worth the change. If you need your outlook on life changed paradigmatically, mm. West Africa is the place to go. Many years ago, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Roland Wesley took 15 young men, African-American, on a trip to Ghana, West Africa. I was one of the lecturers along with One Africa, who was also a lecturer, and I was the one who was on the plane with those young men when they were heading to Ghana, West Africa, and they were heading to Africa for the first time. I got a chance to see young men who were involved in the hip life. They were dressed in urban wear. They were dressed like young people. They were acting like young men would. Uh, they were uh, all together and they, were, they had their earbuds in their ears. They uh, were listening to their music. They were dressed the way our children, you'll find them commonly dressed. Uh, but I watched them all the way to Amsterdam and then all the way to Ghana and they had no idea who I was. When we arrived in Ghana, that was when I realized that those young men weren't supposed to make the trip. All of the sponsors had withdrawn their support two weeks prior to the trip. So Dr. Roland Wesley was found in a situation where he had to pay the other 50% of the rest of the 15 boys who were going on that trip. He could not see not doing the right thing by those young men. But I will say this, that when those young men returned home two weeks later, that those people who pulled their money back who didn't want to invest because they didn't know about the security of the boys, they didn't want to take responsibility, they didn't think that the trip would really prove to be beneficial to the boys, so they withdrew their support at the last minute. 
Within two weeks after those boys returned, their testimony was so powerful that all of those people who withdrawn their support gave their support to Dr. Roland Wesley. And so they got a chance to see up close and personal as to how important it is to give philanthropically, to help young people, to have this experience, or people who are not so young but can't afford it on their own to be able to support because each one of those individuals that gave for those young men to go felt so good on the inside. Why? Because those young men came back. All of them were decent students. They were doing very well and they were all seniors in high school and they had all been accepted into a college. But when they returned, the thing that they said to people who asked them, how was your experience? Was, I will never be the same. I won't take living life for granted anymore. I won't take women for granted anymore. And I will do my best because I got a chance to see young people in school who have nothing and yet they're studying hard. I will do my best to become the best student that I can possibly be. So if you start working, looking at it from a standpoint of your philanthropic gift gave a student a renewed outlook and appreciation on life and at the same time with a renewed energy and a renewed enthusiasm for education just that alone is enough to say let me change the trajectory of someone's life but not only that when these young men come back saying that I want to respect women more where did that come from there were just all kinds of messages, all kinds of uh, training uh, uh, mechanisms taking place, even though we had not even counted on that as a part of the Sankofa trip. They just collectively agreed that we need to start respecting our women more. And who wouldn't want to put their resources into those kinds of lives, not lives that are going to be wasted on the street, wasted uh, in their minds, but lives that have had an experience that says, I have been so privileged and I've been so blessed and I, I didn't know it. I didn't even appreciate it, but now I do and I want to be a better citizen. So ultimately what the Sankofa experience does is it makes better citizens out of those who participate. So those who give so that others might be able to go, what you're doing is you're actually improving our own community when you do. Let's go right there. I ain't got to add nothing to that. You got to chop that up right there. What you doing? What you waiting on? <laughs> Now that you've learned more about the Sankofa Tour, I hope that you've made the decision to travel with us. For more information, you can call 708-401-4013 or 708-227-3189. You can visit SankofaVentures.org or Damati.net. Thank you, and I hope that we'll be traveling together soon. The picture behind me is a picture of the Jinnamei uh, symbol, which is an Adinkra symbol. These are ancient symbols that were used by the Akan-speaking people in order to convey messages. This particular symbol is, I accept none but God, or accept God. In other words, without God, there's no knowledge. Without God, there's no victory. So accept God. And uh, again, there's another translation that says that uh, I fear no one but God. I have no other adversary that I should be concerned about but God. And then also fear can be that reverential respect. We should always reverence God. So it's a very ancient language, a very ancient symbol, but it certainly symbolizes who we are in our spiritual context right now.